So, a couple of years back, I was getting ready to go hiking with a friend. And she made the comment, I don't even remember what we were talking about, but she made the comment that we were reaching the age where people around us were going to start dying. And I kind of went, mm, yeah, I guess. <laughs> Parked my car, and because priorities, I knew I wasn't going to have a chance to check my phone for a couple of hours, went on to Facebook before I started hiking, and found that the wife of a friend had posted that he had died the previous night. And it gave me a real grasp of mortality, especially like moving into middle age and what that really meant. So in keeping with that theme of mortality, I want to tell you a little bit about my last week or so and why I probably forgot to put on a mic this morning. On Thursday night, my mom conference called my sister and I and said that her doctor was sending her to the ER with some emergency tests. And they did a CAT scan and within a couple of hours came back and said they thought she had pancreatic cancer. So I spent the next day making travel arrangements to leave immediately after church that Sunday and getting in order all the things that you do when a parent is faced with serious illness. And then the day after that, I had the extremely bizarre and wrenching experience of the motorcyclist that I talked about last week wrecking on the side of the road right next to my house and that I was with him when he died. And the day after that, I left town. And then at the time since, it's been confirmed that my mom does have pancreatic cancer. I was out there until last night. I drove home late last night. And her life and the lives of her closest family members have been thrown into upheaval. There is not one relevant thing in any of our lives that is unscathed. And because we, don't, we all live in different places, we don't even know what any single day in months to come looks like. But as most of us here already know, it's in these times that feel like cataclysm or that actually are cataclysm that God reminds us that we are so not alone. So soon after I came back in the house from that experience with the motorcyclist, I just had the weird thought, I guess because we're so attached to social media, I had the thought, well, there's something that's not gonna make it on Facebook. And immediately it was like the Holy Spirit kind of grabbed me by the shirt and said, that's not your choice. Posting about this could very well keep someone from driving while impaired or distracted. So I went and I posted about the very last thing that I wanted to share on Facebook for so many obvious reasons. Um, and I don't know if it's kept anybody from driving while impaired or distracted, but I can tell you that I have had more people reach out and contact me privately than I had any idea were kind of quietly watching my Facebook. And they were, are continuing to tell me that God has put me on their hearts and that they're praying and that they hoped I was okay. And not only did this remind me that God has us covered even in the most difficult times, but I realized that we have a voice and an influence even when we think there are not a lot of people paying attention. So this week, we are talking about how Jesus would vote and how that works in conjunction with the influence that we have. Um, Jesus, as we know, lived in an occupied society and did not have the privilege of voting. Uh, to just recap a little bit of what we've already covered in regard to politics according to Jesus, we discussed how Jesus was constantly calling us to a kingdom way of living, that kingdom is a political term based on a specific, and in this case, a just way of governing. It was established that Christianity is irrefutably public and political, and that we are called to vote in alignment with Jesus' values, not our partisan platforms, and that Jesus modeled being there for others, not reciprocally, meaning not because they are there for us, but sacrificially, whether they care about us or not. So Jesus came to earth to experience everything we experience as humans, including undeserved persecution, but he didn't experience it, and God didn't make sure it was so painstakingly detailed 
um, and so painstakingly documented so we could say, yep, God gets it, God understands how we feel and how people there felt or currently feel in relation to being accused or persecuted or chased. Again, everything we have in the Bible is there so we can derive an understanding or a lesson or both. And the purpose of all the detail of everything that Jesus witnessed and experienced and brought attention to is in large part so we recognize the travesty of no one intervening on behalf of the innocent or the persecuted or the suffering or maybe people who just need compassion and that we don't let that happen on our watch. Mark 10, 42 through 45, and this is from the message translation, says, Jesus got them together to settle things down. You've observed how godless rulers throw their weight around, he said, and when people get a little power, how quickly it goes to their heads. It's not going to be that way with you. Whoever wants to be great must become a servant. Whoever wants to be first among you must be your slave. That is what the Son of Man has done. He came to serve, not to be served, and then to give away his life in exchange for many who are held hostage. Martin Luther King, in his last speech, supporting striking sanitation workers in Memphis, compared the call to action with the story of the Good Samaritan and how the Levite priest chose to walk past the dying man on the road. And MLK said in his speech, I'm gonna read a portion of this here. And so the first question that the Levite asked was, if I stop to help this man, what will happen to me? But then the Good Samaritan came by and he reversed the question. If I do not stop to help this man, what will happen to him? That's the question before you tonight. Not if I stop to help the sanitation workers, what will happen to all of the hours I usually spend in my office every day and every week as a pastor. The question is not if I stop to help this man in need, what will happen to me? If I do not stop to help the sanitation workers, what will happen to them? That's the question. So this is a difficult truth. Jesus and on, on their better days, his disciples role modeled and called us to a sacrificial way of living. And our vote should benefit those even with whom we disagree. Pastor Brandon made it clear last week and in the, the course of this, uh, this series that we as a church community have no stake in this. We are not here to influence you to vote in keeping with any specific party or platform. But the people who do have a stake in this are the people that Jesus referred to as the least of these. And a whole lot of these people are right now voting in a way that decimates their own self-interests, their own financial security, their own access to health care. My God, health care pre-existing conditions. Let me tell you, we will all get there in life. If you don't have pre-existing conditions now, you will. I'm living this right now. And their future well-being in, in profound ways. And I know that some of us would like to say, and have sometimes said, I know that I've said it, just kind of go, bummer for you, whatever happens, that's too bad because not only have you voted against your own self-interest, but you voted against mine and you potentially endangered my loved ones. But that is not a kingdom politic because as Pastor Brandon also reminded us, the golden rule asks us to first consider how we ourselves would like to be treated for the express purpose of calling us to a posture of empathy. One of my very favorite verses that I probably use every other time I preach is Micah 6, 8. And it says, God has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Justice and not self-preservation should be our primary motivator. Jesus was never, ever about self-preservation, and he lived that out consistently, but maybe nowhere as profoundly as at the Last Supper. Here's an innocent man who knows. He is on the way to his execution, <clears throat> and he's taking the time to model love and provision and servanthood. 
washing the feet of his followers and taking the time to remind them to break themselves and to pour themselves out in keeping with his own sacrifice. Luke 7, 11 through 17 says, Soon afterwards, he went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd went with him. As he approached the gate of the town, a man who had died was being carried out. He was his mother's only son. She was a widow, and with her was a large crowd from the town. When the Lord saw her, he had compassion for her and said to her, Do not weep. Then he came forward, touched the bier, that's like the uh, funeral uh, stretcher, and the bearer stood still. And he said, Young man, I say to you, rise. The dead man sat up and began to speak. Jesus gave him to his mother. Fear seized all of them, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has risen among us, and God has looked favorably on his, pe on his people. Then the word about him spread throughout Judea and all the surrounding country. Jesus ministered in a time and place that was surprisingly similar to our own. And like most societies, both ancient and contemporary, there were religious and socio-political elites and hypocrites and oppressors, which means that obviously there were also the oppressed and the marginalized. And these were the people with whom Jesus perpetually aligned himself, ultimately calling his followers and his observers to a way of compassion and sacrifice. So Luke 7 as a whole is especially instrumental in, in setting Jesus up as a representative of the Lord. And in the beginning of this chapter, he heals the servant of the Roman centurion. He's nowhere near him. He just does this pretty much by proclamation. And then at verse 11, Jesus and this large crowd of followers who are on a high. They've just been watching Jesus do cool miracles, and they're excited. They're psyched. They enter the town of Nain, and they encounter a funeral procession. Being carried by the mourners is the only son of this widow, and Jesus immediately compre expresses compassion, telling this woman not to cry. And he approaches the pallet, stopping this procession in its tracks. Also, like the large crowd that was with this woman, these were not her supporters. These were paid mourners. They were there just for the, the optics of a funeral, and they would abandon her immediately after. So he stops this funeral procession in its tracks, speaks to the young man, and tells him to rise. He immediately gets up and begins speaking, and the crowd is simultaneously awed and fearful at what they've seen. They acknowledge that God is undeniably at work and news about this particular incident spreads throughout the entire region. But for our purposes, the most compelling aspect of this is the social justice perspective. We often hear Luke referred to as the gospel of women or as the gospel of the poor. And the emphasis on caring for the marginalized and the oppressed can't be overlooked. And this specific sequence of events has the effect of humanizing Jesus to the people who are watching. He responds not only to the grief that goes along with being a parent losing your child, but to a woman in a culture who with no male to support her is literally going to end up begging on the streets. And that a soon to be destitute woman would consume the total attention of a Jewish rabbi would make a huge impact on the perceptions of those watching, not to mention the scriptural significance and the effect that this had on generations to come, has had, continues to have. And this passage also contains the first time that the author of Luke refers to Jesus as the Lord. We tend to equate that term with Omnip the omnipotence and the sovereignty of God. But I found this Lord reference from verse 13 to be much deeper than that because it reads, when the Lord saw her, he had compassion for her and said to her, do not weep. The reference here to Jesus as Lord comes not when he's raising someone from the dead, but when he is seeing someone in their distress. And this, incidentally, is the same thing that Hagar resonated with when she was fleeing abuse at the hands of her owners, Sarah and Abraham, and I use that term owners intentionally, 
This is in Genesis 16. And she was restored by being seen by God. So back to this Luke 7 account. When Jesus first comes upon the funeral procession, he is, again, in the company of this large, excited following. And they would likely know by now that the centurion's servant had indeed been healed, and they would be celebrating. Jesus, however, hones in on the immediate emotional and practical needs. He has no obligation to maintain the party mood. He meets the woman right where she is at. He alleviates her emotional pain, and he provides for her practical needs by performing the greatest miracle of all, bringing life from death. And she's comforted. Her needs are met. The crowd is odd. God gets the glory, and you'd think that's the end of the story. But it's not, because there is such profound instruction for us in this passage, especially in a world where most of the world's poor are women and the children who are dependent upon them. And that's not just then, that's now. Jesus was bringing attention to a distinct social malady and demonstrating that action should be imperative. Without her son to support her financially, this woman would be destitute. And Jesus' message here, excuse me, is not, well, we made this woman's day, Too bad for all those other women who don't have me to perform a miracle for them. Part of the the intention in working this miracle in front of these two large and emotionally disparate crowds was to force confrontation about injustice and subsequent suffering. Jesus didn't hide his own distress in response to this woman's crisis. And everything he did on this earth was intended to inform our responses. As Christ followers, we are supposed to be distressed by suffering. I want to sidetrack for a moment and say, in reference to suffering, we used to be, and we still, we still do prioritize um, social services and food support, and those types of needs, but they've fallen by the wayside. And we as Christians have, Christians are sometimes the loudest voice for for voting from this place of fear. Like, oh my gosh, that $120 that it's going to cost me to pay for somebody else's health care, God will never make that up. We need to be in a space of trusting. In my mom's hospital room, in the bed next to her, was a woman who um, was alone. And I heard her telling the doctor that she was there um, with heart issues and that she lived in a board and care. And my mom had constant visitors and were loud and kind of irreverent and were there laughing in the hospital and just being family. And our family, it's not an easy family relationship, but the the distress I felt and the conviction I felt that my mom had all of this support there while this woman had no one. In the three days that we spent near this woman's bed, no one. Not one time did anybody come and check on her except for um, hospital staff. And by not prioritizing compassionate stances in our voting, We have driven ourselves to a place where even if we are provided for, think about candy stripers, think about volunteering and how much more prevalent that used to be. Right now, we are also pushed up against the wall just trying to maintain life and provision for ourselves. We don't even have the bandwidth to intervene on the behalf of others. This is something we can change by how we vote and by how we are involved. So this past week, I got a prayer request in the middle of all this from someone that I don't really know all that well, saying that her cousin had just finished a round of chemo and was having some nausea and asking for prayer so that she wouldn't be suffering. And if you belong to any prayer groups, you know that this is not an uncommon prayer request. But let me tell you, I prayed differently for that prayer request than I have ever prayed before because soon it will be my loved one receiving chemo, and I'm going to be the one asking people to pray that there not be suffering. 
So all of our experiences are not only so we can model something better, but so we can also learn from and empathize with each other and have better responses for the good of those around us. A friend of mine recently shared the following on Facebook, and this is about Eugene Peterson, who wrote the message version of the Bible that we just had that verse from in Mark. She said, I understand that Eugene Peterson, writer of the message interpretation of the Bible, has entered hospice. I pray for him and his family in a scary season. His riffs on the Bible have made a particular interpretation of God's stories more accessible to people, which is overall a very good thing. I find myself thinking of him coming out in support of the LGBTQ community last year and then realizing how mad it made some of his fans and rescinding his support. I find myself wondering if he had known he might be meeting his maker soon, if that would have made him braver and kinder and more willing to publicly claim his beliefs. If he had known that his opponents would have much time left to hate and condemn him, would, have it, would it have been easier to live his truth? Because his support meant life. His rescinding of that support did not serve anyone. And so today, I invite all of us to be brave in being compassionate and to risk the consequences when we believe it will make the world a better place. Too much right now is driven by fear. We need both love and bravery right now. That admonition that she called out to embrace love and bravery is for us. That whole thing I discussed at the beginning of this message about realizing the opportunity for influence we have on people whose radar we don't even realize that we're on made me think of something that I heard in a recent sermon most non-Christian or non-religious or non-spiritual people, or even Christians with whom we have disagreements, won't likely have a conversation with someone like the Pope or the president of our denomination or even an actual theologian, but they will interact with us. And we need to be the representation of Christ, not just in our words and our interactions and how we prioritize others, but by first in actually voting, and then in how we vote. So I feel like this has been a super heavy message, and I wanna close with something not so dire, but still hopeful. A few weeks back, Pastor Brandon and I were having a conversation kind of about the state of our country, um, and his take, and, and our world also, and his take, to his huge credit, was that big picture, he really believed that things were getting better, and my response was, you think so? I sure hope. But honestly, I came away feeling like humanity just gets worse. And then a couple of days later, I was at Disneyland, and I can't even like to go to like Disneyland, like the cringy privilege of saying, and then I went to Disneyland. So, <laughs> anyway, my favorite ride at Disneyland is Pirates of the Caribbean, in spite of the fact that it's probably the most sexist attraction in the whole entire park. <laughs> and if you're not familiar with it, there's actually a scene where there's a sign that says something like, buy a wench for a bride, and the women are tied up and on display, and there's an overseer with a whip, I kid you not, and it's just heinous. So when my sister April and I were in like our early 20s and first realized what was going on with this, and it took us this long as native Californians who spent our whole childhood at Disneyland, it took us that long to realize, wait, what? Um, we were horrified and we discussed it repeatedly and we tied it into our increasing um, recognition and awareness of sexism and oppression in our world. And we wrote these very lucid, passionate letters to the Disney CEO. And we expected change. I mean, we were pointing out something that was outdated and shouldn't be happening. And we really thought that, you know, something was gonna happen. And this is obviously when we were far less jaded and thought our passion for justice could even transform corporate monoliths. But then decades of frequent visits to Disneyland, not to mention everyday living, showed us just how entrenched systems of oppression were. And we didn't give up hope, we were just more realistic. And I remember actually thinking 
on this recent trip to Disneyland, on my first ride on Pirates, how innocent we were to think that we could make a difference. And I kid you not, at that very moment, while I'm thinking this, Kylie, my son's girlfriend, said, did you hear they changed the auction? I was reading about it on the internet. I was like, no way, because we're still like two minutes away. Sure enough, when we got there, they were now auctioning surrendered loot and farm animals, and the most prominent woman who had previously been on the auction block was now a pirate herself, and there were no more women for sale. It was mind-blowing. So this might seem insignificant in comparison to a woman receiving back her dead son, or a devastating cancer diagnosis, or how we vote. But I see the evolution of these messages as so clearly aligned because we, like a society that would allow a widow at her lowest and most vulnerable point to end up on the streets, and if you don't realize it, that's our society right now, we know right from wrong, where we are tempted to justify things we shouldn't, or just ignore them, or say, I can't change, Jesus calls out injustice and hypocrisy and shows us how we are expected to respond. A lack of progress or entrenched systems never gives us the right to turn our backs. We have an obligation to vote and to do so in keeping with the priorities of Jesus. So right now, we have kind of a new thing that we do. Um, we take three minutes just to be in silence. So I'm gonna invite you as we prepare to have both feet on the ground, to take a breath in and release it. One more, breathe in and release it. Just allow yourself silence. 